Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Ready for the event. Voice of America, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is the Voice of America. We're in Roman Mamanov. Can you hear me? I have you loud and clear, Roman. Uh, Peggy, it's really a big honor to see you and to have you with us. I have to tell you that for some reason I have like a goosebumps. I'm so excited and I am so admire you, your work there in space. Let me begin with real simple questions. What time is it there? Should I say good morning? Should I say good, good evening? Should I say good, uh, good afternoon? It's 13.41, so 1.41 in the afternoon. Uh, we run on Greenwich Mean Time here, getting up around 6 a.m. and going to bed around 9 p.m. in the evening. Um, and because we work with control centers all around the world, they are working on various different shifts uh, throughout their nights, their relative nights. But uh, we, we stay on a standard day uh, based off Greenwich Mean Time. Can you tell us more about the everyday life? Because a lot of uh, people in our audience actually ask us to ask this question. How you guys work? What time is sunrise there? What time is sundown? Like how you split the shifts between each other? Actually, uh, during the course of a day, because we're traveling around the planet once every 90 minutes, we have 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. So it's, uh, we don't use the sun as our, our guide for when to go to bed. It's more based on just the time, time of day. So it, it works out fine for us. Uh, we don't have as many windows as I would like to have on board the space station, so it's not a huge distraction uh, to us to have sunrise and sunset every 45 minutes or so. Uh, Peggy, we asked our audience to send us questions that they want to ask you, and uh, a lot of questions about how you live in zero gravity. Uh, what kind of what kind of effect it has for your body? Uh, muscle loss, bone loss. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, being in microgravity without uh, gravity to pull on us, our bones do uh, feel the effects. They don't respond normally, and so we have uh, pretty significant bone demineralization. It's actually probably about 10 times more than an osteoporotic woman would lose in uh, a month on Earth, uh, is what we would lose uh, over the course of uh, a year. So it's, it's very important for us to study and understand those effects. We also have fluid shifts that change uh, maybe some potential effects on our vision and our eyes. So there's lots of changes going on in our body, and we are doing many different kinds of research studies to better understand those changes in space. Uh, can you tell us if you miss actually gravity? Do you miss the chance to walk with barefoot on the green grass or put the barefoot on the water and in the sea? Well, I, if, if the question is, do I miss gravity? Mostly I can say, no, I don't miss gravity. I think uh, moving around up here is very easy. Uh, it's nice once you get adapted to it, you feel comfortable in any orientation. And so being in the lack of gravity is actually very comfortable once you adapt. Uh, it's only when you lose a tool and instead of just looking on the floor for it, you have to look everywhere for it. <laughs> That's when you miss maybe gravity. But to say whether or not I miss walking on a beach or uh, swimming in the lake, that, that's a different question. Yes, I do miss those things a little bit uh, at times. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about International Space Station and which part of International Space Station you are right now? Because we usually see just two kinds of pictures, outside of Space Station and that picture that you are right now. So which part of this is 
and uh, where you guys sleep or have dinner, for example. Actually, this is the U.S. laboratory. It's uh, my favorite module because it's got the most scientific uh, uh, hardware in it that I enjoy using the most. Uh, but we have uh, behind this panel, we have this big combustion chamber where we do studies on flames. Ne uh, right up next to that, we have a microgravity sciences glove box where we can uh, stick our arms inside a closed environment and work on different studies. We have another uh, biophysics. Uh, it's basically an enclosed microscope looking at, um, for instance, uh, biological processes that take a long time, like protein crystallization. We've got a, a 3D printer that makes objects for us. We've got incubators and refrigerators and freezers uh, to store all our samples that we're collecting as part of the different scientific investigations. Uh, but the, the laboratories, most of the uh, U.S. operating segment laboratories like this, uh, and they were designed to be somewhat interchangeable. So a rack from this module can move to another module and we can outfit it based on uh, the scientific research that we're doing at the time. Peggy, our viewer Ivan actually asked us, uh, let's speak more about uh, how your body feels in zero gravity. Uh, do you feel different with how you feel, uh, how you taste food, uh, how you smell different smells. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. And I'm not quite sure I got that. Do I feel differently being in space? Um, from a physiological uh, perspective, a it's not so much. Food? Uh, uh, do I feel differently about food in space? Um, here, the food uh, is is a somewhat limited in uh, selection, so <laughs> there is some sense of uh, lack of variety after some period of time. But uh, the food that we do have is actually quite good. Can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of experiments you are working on right now? Should we expect any breakthrough anytime soon? Uh, anytime soon? And can you give us an example of research that uh, was made on the International Space Station and changed our everyday lives? Well, it's interesting that you ask that question because research on the ground takes many, many years. and. Uh, that's actually the benefit of having this laboratory here is that we can conduct experiments over many different years. Uh, for instance, on my first expedition, we were doing a plant growth study. Uh, and the interesting thing that's been used and benefited uh, people on Earth is not necessarily the results of the plant growth experiment exactly, but the filtration systems that they used in the the uh, hardware that the plants were growing in. Those filtration systems are now used in uh, uh, medical surgical rooms and also in uh, wineries to try and keep out bacterial uh, contamination in wines. So you never know exactly what the spin-off uh, that's going to be used that will apply to Earth, but there's always going to be something, and that's that's the benefit of doing long duration research like what we're doing up here. I, I think there are so many, for instance, on our expedition, we have approximately 280 different investigations going on. And it's, uh, some of them are controlled completely by the ground. Some of them we interact with heavily. Some of them are on ourselves um, personally. So it's, it's a huge variety of different types of investigations. And I think there's a lot of potential application um, to the ground. Although just like research on the ground, we can't always predict what that, that, that breakthrough will be. I have uh, two follow-up questions, uh, speaking about the filtration system. Speaking with President Trump, you said that there on International Space Station, you treat 
green and treat water so it's possible to drink it again. Uh, is it just an experiment or is it just a part of the regular life? And I also, I remember the scene from a uh, film with um, uh, Matt Damon about Mark. He used poop to grow potato. Is it how uh, people will live in the future in different, uh, on a different planet, you think? Well, if you think about how much water you need every day, and you think about a trip to Mars, for instance, and say we're going to go to Mars and stay for a year and then come back, we need three years worth of supply of water. And that's a lot of mass of water. And that's for every individual that's flying. And you might want some contingency water just in case. And so having that mass, being able to recycle uh, water is going to be a huge savings in our capability to outfit uh, vehicles for the future transport to Mars and living on Mars or any other planet that we might end up choosing or any other spacecraft that we might want to be on. So what we're doing here is trying to close the, our life support system such that we can recycle absolutely everything that we can. Right now, in terms of water, we're around 85% able to recycle all our, all our water. We still, if in order to go to Mars or to be very efficient when we go to Mars, we need to be at 100% or very, very close to that, um, that goal. And here on the space station, we're working on that goal. We're practicing it every day since 2009. We've had the urine processing and water processing system up here and have been actually uh, processing urine and actually drinking it. So it's, uh, I think, an engineering experiment every day here on board the station. We're learning things that are going to help us in those future exploration missions, but also going to help us uh, on the ground. For instance, in areas where uh, you might have a lack of water or need to reclaim water, we could develop uh, urine processing or water processing systems that might aid people on the ground as well. So the research won't be just for space benefits, but also has some potential for Earth benefits as well. So I, I'm very happy that we are doing all this research here. You know, we take all our power is from the sun, uh, and we use that power to break apart the water to make our oxygen that we breathe. The, the byproducts of hydrogen actually get recombined with the carbon dioxide that we clean out of the air and made back into water. It's a, it's a really cool process of uh, recycling that we're doing here. You told about future possible Mars mission or any other planet. Would you like to be part of, let's say, among the people who will be flying there? I absolutely would. I think, you know, all of us that sign up to be astronauts are explorers and are interested in that kind of thing. I know there are lots of people on Earth doing different types of exploration type studies, either underwater in the Antarctic. Uh, so I think that it's you know, part of our, who we are as people to explore, and I would love to be a part of it. Uh, let's speak a little bit more about everyday life on the International Space Station. Um, our audience asks us, uh, do you have time to follow the news from Earth, political, economic, culture, or even showbiz? And if so, how do you do that? Do you have, like, uh, LCD TV, or use your laptop, or just computer. We have lots of computers on board, and the ground sends up whatever our preferences are. You know, if we have sports bus, they send up uh, the sports games for um, whatever the favorite team is, or your favorite TV shows, or the news. So it's whatever your preferences are that that they send up and and. Uh, for entertainment for us, which is great. I love uh, working out and watching the news or watching uh, some TV shows while I'm actually working out. It takes my mind off of the, the uh, pain of the workout.
Uh, what was the last time, I mean, what was the last thing you actually watched? I don't know, CNN or some kind of uh, sport broadcasting or um, a movie? Uh, this morning when I was working out on A-Red, I was watching uh, the nightly news. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, do you guys discuss politics in uh, International Space Station and space? Um, of course, you, I guess you understand that we have, uh, let's say, tensions between Russia and the United States. Do you guys discuss that or you try to avoid that? I think up here our priority is being one team, and so I think we don't discuss things that have the potential uh, for that kind of political reaction. We, we recognize that what we're doing here is very special, uh, you know, and unique, uh, uh, you know, this peaceful development of space. I have a very specific question from our audience. A lot of people believe in UFOs. Do you have any spe special instructions in case you see something like unidentified flying object outside the International Space Station? And would you like to meet some of these, uh, let's say, green people, green creatures? Well, actually, there, there are no special instructions. Um, but I do think it, it would be very interesting. I would love to meet uh, people from another world. Uh, Peggy, obviously you guys there uh, have internet and space and uh, you guys are very active on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. How does it work? Do you have just like a simple gadget like smartphones, or like we all have here uh, on the Earth. And what about Wi-Fi? Do you have like a regular Wi-Fi or special system? We have uh, special networks up here that we can access. We can access uh, the Internet, but it's extremely slow. When we have a particular type of, uh, of satellite coverage, we can access the Internet, but it's extremely slow. In general, we tend to provide our inputs to be posted by somebody on the ground. So we, we give the inputs, send them down to somebody because our email gets synchronized every time we have a KU a type of uh, antenna coverage that uh, can, delay, can get that information down to the ground. So that seems to be the most efficient at this point in time since our, our uh, internet is more like dial-up speeds. Uh, Peggy, I have a personal question. You, uh, you have so many records. You were twice commander of the space station, the commander of the mission, uh, expedition. Um, you, you will be, you, you break so many records. Do you feel like you break the glass ceiling for women in space? You know, the, the records to me, I think, just represent where we are uh, in the space program and being able to represent NASA as a part of that, I think, is very special for me. And I, I'm thrilled to have had these opportunities. And I am sure that if we are successful in our programs, that my records will be broken. And that's fine. That's what it's about. Every day we should be setting new records, looking toward the next step and uh, expanding our capabilities and our knowledge. Peggy Whitson, the board engineer, uh, 52nd expedition MKS. Uh, Mr. Whitson, I can't express your gratitude for that you found time and gratitude to Houston and us for that we were able to organize this event. Thank you for being with us. It was a special project at the present time. MKS Live. We'll see you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you all participants. With Voice of America, we are now resuming operational audio communications.